Amen. Good evening, everybody. And Ellie said good morning. I was very close. You guys can sit down. And Lord God, I thank you for an amazing day. And Lord God, I thank you for everything that you want us to speak about and, and, uh, and learn. And I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And Lord God, you know, <laughs> we, uh, we've been having a blessed week since Friday, uh, since uh, Sunday as well. Actually, since before then. And uh, there's some more supernatural events that are taking place this week even. Uh, and uh, I think last week I explained to you about how we are uh, living in the last days, but also the last uh, week and a half before uh, Rosh Hashanah, or Rosh Hashanah, I don't know how to pronounce it yet. I heard like two or three different people, exp all Jewish people all pronounce it differently. And I'm trying my absolute best at this moment, right? But it's next week, Thursday. It's next week, Thursday. It's the beginning of the next year. And uh, this is, this, th th there's, there's some other like incredible things that are actually taking place during this time. Uh, and I found out about it yesterday. Uh, if you guys didn't know, there's actually a second moon that's going to come into Earth's orbit. <laughs> Which I <laughs> didn't figure out. But it's called a mini moon. And uh, it's coming into the Earth's orbit and it spins faster than the regular moon and will only be here during all the feast days and is going to leave j at the last feast day. Like, wh what are the odds, right? So that's got to mean something. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a moon that is uh, roughly 11 meters wide, I believe it is, or in, I think diameter. Uh, you cannot just normally see it. You need a special telescope and stuff like that. But it is a asteroid big enough to be considered a tiny moon. And um, so you can't see it with the naked eye, but the Bible does explain about times and seasons, and uh, I did preach about that in a bit more detail. The Bible speaks about it in Genesis, uh, in, in chapter 1, uh, and it says that the uh, sun and the moon are given for signs for you to understand the times and seasons. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to, I'm just reading quickly. Uh, and uh, it says that it was given so you can rule at different times of the day, but also for you to determine when things come about or when things should come about. You see, the, the, the signs in the heavens, and Jesus speaks about it before he comes back, they are given as like an alarm clock moment. And you may be thinking, what, what are we talking about? Well, if you have an alarm, uh, people used to have it on their watches, but now they are, they are, they've got slaved to digital devices, so now they have it on their phones. Uh, so <laughs> every couple of hours... They, uh, or when before a certain meeting, their phone will give them a notification or a ding or a, an alarm will go off to tell them that whatever they're doing now is wrong and that they should be doing something else. So for example, uh, just before another meeting, it'll ring and go like, in the next five minutes, you have a meeting with somebody else. So stop whatever you're doing now and do this instead. And uh, so, you know, this is how I said, like, you know, they're just slaves to the calendar and things like that. But... God has his own calendar, and when certain events happen in the skies, in the heavens and things like that, uh, as described here in the book of Genesis, it means that those are alarm clock moments for you to say, you are doing the wrong thing, change now and do the right thing. And uh, so you see quite a lot of these weird different things happening around time, and uh, now we have this new second moon that's coming. Uh, and it's only coming during the feast days. And a moon represents something in, in, the, in the spirit. Uh, in the Bible, says, you know, God is the sun. And the moon is, is described in Hebrew as the bride of the sun. And they believe that they are married in the way that it work, and that they have faith in each other. When one moves, the other must move as well. Uh, and we actually find this in the Bible. We also find this in the book of Enoch. He writes about how they move and stuff like that. Uh, and the Bible explains, like, the moon being the bride is very similar to the, the church being the bride of Christ, the moon being the bride of the sun. We are the church, we're the bride of the sun, Jesus. Uh, and so it, it actually, uh, there, there's some symbolism inside there, right? And uh, we can go on for hours and hours about this two symbolism because there's actually a lot in there uh, to, to explain about it. But you, you, when you have a moon moving at different speeds, uh, in the Bible it actually dictates a certain acceleration in things happening. 
This is why you've heard many people prophesy and preach about double-double and double the speed and all these things like that, because two moons means double speed. <laughs> this is why it, double blessing in Isaiah 57, you know, and, uh, and in Psalms as well, talking about double blessings and you shall have double, double this is actually a representation of double moons. Uh, so there, there's some hidden mysteries inside there, right? But we're not going to speak about that today because those are, you know, it's a very, very deep stuff. And we're not talking about it today. But uh, before we wanted to start speaking about it was uh, about two or three weeks ago, I spoke to you about the different levels of interpretation of Scripture. And I said there are five different level, there are five different types of interpretation. Uh, my one, I said, was narrative, literal, figurative, spiritual, and supernatural. Uh, and um, this is something that I that I, I learned, and also that you know that we that um, it, uh, I, I learned from God, and we, we we put it through because I found out you can always do this. What I didn't know up until last week is that the Hebrews also believe this, except they believe it in a different fashion. They believe that there are four levels of interpretation of all Scripture, and they have a Hebrew word for each level. And the one that I call considered level one, which is narrative. They don't even consider it a level of interpretation. They call that reading. <laughs> so they have uh, Hebrew words for each level. And depending upon how deep you go in each one, uh, uh, you, know, you, you have to first understand entirely the top level before you can go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And uh, I don't remember all the Hebrew words, but I remember the English interpretation of each word. So I'll give you that, right? So the first one that they believe is the same one that I said. It is literal translation. In Hebrew, it means the literal interpretation of the scriptures. And in the top literal level, uh, each level, I should say this before we continue, brings a different level of revelation. And that's very, very important because you have Christians that, are, that have, a, um, uh, <laughs> they have a confusion, right? They, for some reason, keep praying to God to give them more power. They're like, give us more power, Lord. Please touch me with more power. I want more power. No, no. They're like a Sith Lord, right? We must have more power. No. <laughs> right? That's, that's not what happens, right? And uh, the Bible never speaks about that. Instead, it says something else. You go from glory to glory. And there's something very important there because people somehow believe that certain people in the, in the, in the body of Christ have more power than others. And that some have a double portion and some have a this portion and some have a that portion. That's not anywhere in the New Testament. The New Testament has a different form of governance. And you'll find in the Old Testament they spoke about one portion and a double portion and a this portion and a, and a this. And it comes down. But Jesus wipes that whole slate clean. What do you mean? Well, Jesus said the person with the most amount of power, the one with the most doublest power of all kinds, is John the Baptist. And the least in the kingdom has more power than he does. You see, what happens is one pastor was praying for this. And I really love the way that God answered him. He was praying, Lord, I need more power because I need to solve this problem. And God said to him, where must I get it from? And he said, what do you mean? He said, I gave you the blood of Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit inside you and you have a covenant with me. You have the entire triune God inside you. Where, where are we going to get more power from? You, 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 and then they were like, but, but, you know, this and that. And he says, no, the Bible says my people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. Destroyed is the word killed, physically killed. Steal, kill, destroy, right? Destroy means murder. My people are murdered because they have no power, they have no knowledge. No knowledge because they can't use anything that they have. So this is what you find in Ephesians 1.17, right? I really, we, you know, we... This is something I prayed uh, every single day for about three or four months. Uh, and uh, in the morning, Ephesians 1.17, because Paul says you should pray it all the time. And eventually you will get it because once you pray to God, he's going to answer the prayer and he's going to give it to you. Ephesians 1.17. Uh, go back one, uh, one verse, sorry, uh, just, just so we can continue. It says, I pray always for you guys. Uh, there we go. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, dot, dot, telling you what he's praying for. The next line. <laughs> that the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, glory means physical wealth, if you didn't know that, may give you the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that's the Holy Spirit, excuse me, 
and uh, the, the Holy Spirit and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Next line tells us, uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That means you not just have the revelation, but you actually knew what it meant. <laughs> It's not like, oh, this, this is interesting. It's, it's like, I understand what he's actually trying to convey. That you may know what the hope of his calling is. In other words, what your calling is. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? In other words, the great riches that God has laid up for you on the earth. Right? Paul ex expounds this and said, the whole earth is yours. Whether you want this or that or any part of land, everything is yours, is your inheritance. Next one. In other words, and what is the exceedingly greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, these are two separate lines. Can you notice that, right? One is power working towards you, and the other one is his mighty power working. The, 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 he separates it. Why are they separated? Right? Now, let's go to the next one. And it says, uh, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So there's two different definitions of that power. There's a separation. But it is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Now the Bible actually tells us that Christ raised himself from the dead. People, so, uh, a lot of people believe that you need someone to pray for you to be raised from the dead. There's actually multiple uh, uh, testimonies of people who died and resurrected themselves. We actually know somebody who just happened. He got resurrected and he woke up in the morgue with a toe tag on him. There's uh, quite a lot of different, uh, it is a very scary story actually, we should find out about it. But uh, there's quite a lot of people who said they've, you know, they've died and they wake up afterward on their own. But here it says here that this power that raised Christ from the dead and see him in right hand in heavenly places, this power is inside you. But you notice there's a comma there, right? Because it's not done yet. Let's look at the next one. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. In other words, any other power, any other might, any other dominion, this is more powerful. You have the most power. You don't need any more power. And every name that is named, you have greater authority over all other things. Not only in this time or this age, but also in the ages or the times that is to come. In other words, this is a new time, this is the, the modern day age. Well, you have more power than them anyway. Right, next one. So you, and put all things under his feet. That means all things, any name that can be named, any government that can be named, any, any uh, corporation that can be named, any group that can be named, it is under the feet of Jesus and gave him to be head over all things in the church. You have power over all things, and he is the head of the church. But it's still, still going on, right? Because it's still teaching about this power and this revelation. Look at the next one. And it tells you, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills uh, all in all. This is us, the body. Next one. He's, he's praying for them every single day that they may understand all of this. Okay, you, 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 you can oh, continue. And you made, and he, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, and he, he's, he's going to continue and continue. But let me, let, me, let me stop here before we go too far along, right? You have no power shortage. <laughs> can you go back to the line about power where it's got the two different types of power? There's a separation involved there. You have no power shortage. You don't need any more double portion because the Bible says you have Jesus' double portion. You are a joint heir with Christ. You have every power Jesus has, you have it too. There is, you, 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 and, uh, and Jesus even tells us in John, God loves you and respects you the same amount as Jesus. He prays that and says, you love them just as much as you love me. And you answer my prayers just as much as you answer their prayers. And Jesus is our high priest. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. There we go. That's the right one. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. There's a separation here because number one is direction, aiming. Number two is potency. 
Number one, the direction toward you is the direction in which the power is aimed. That means you can have all the power in the world and miss the shot and it won't matter. And number two, it says according to the working of his mighty power, that means you have the amount of power is equal to God's. Because it says his mighty power, not your mighty power through Christ. The working of God's mighty power. So what's, I mean, if I continue with the Star Wars and, uh, you know, analogies, you can have the power of the Death Star, but if you miss the target you're hitting, it doesn't matter. And Paul is trying to tell people that this is what's wrong with them. This is why he keeps talking about revelation and revelation and revelation and revelation and enlightenment. He gives us all the different forms of revelation, enlightenment, and wisdom, and the spirit, and knowing how to use it, and then he speaks about power. Because it doesn't matter how powerful your bazooka is, if you can't fire it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good your pistol is, you're going to lose if you can't shoot it. And this is what's wrong with Christians. They have all the power of the Holy Spirit within them, the mighty rushing wind, but they can't shoot the gun, and when they do shoot it, they miss over and over and over again. And the Bible even tells us this. He says, do not pray amiss. Don't miss your shot. If a creature is running towards you, and the animal is going to kill you, if you miss, it's going to continue running towards you. You can shoot all your bullets, but eventually it's going to kill you. This is what's wrong with Christians in the, in the church. They don't have a power shortage. They have a revelation shortage. They don't know how to use anything. I have a sword of the spirit, but you don't know how to fight. I have a shield of faith, but you're holding it wrong. On Sunday, we, uh, oh, no, I don't think it was the Sunday, I think it was the Sunday before, I spoke about uh, King Ahab. He had all the armor, and an arrow comes right in between the joints and shoots him fatally. It doesn't matter all the armor of God you have, if, they, if you don't hold it, and if you don't present yourself the way you're supposed to, you are open to attack. There are multiple ways if you, if you learn combat sports and fighting and things like that. Uh, you, you can very easily knock a sword or a shield or even the helmet or a breastplate off of somebody as long as you hit them in the right place at the right time. You have things like parrying, you have things like thrusts, you know, slashes and different ways of attacking. And depending upon how the guy is holding the shield, if you hit the shield enough times, it will break or it will just come off of his hand. And, uh, you know, I, when I spoke about the, uh, the armor of God and when Paul was talking about the armor of God, the shield of faith was not made of metal the way that people think it is. It was actually made of a type of hardened leather with metal pieces on it. The hardened leather needed to be constantly re-oiled with, uh, you know, olive oil or some other oil so that the metal was supple and was able to deflect the slashes of the, of the sword or the, uh, uh, the arrows that were coming at them. The oil would not just protect the shield itself, but it would deflect the uh, attacks off of it, right? So you need the anointing over the, all the time, and you need to have maintenance, keeping up your spirit of faith. Otherwise, your shield will get brittle, and the guy will hit you once, twice with the sword, and the shield will shatter into a million pieces. Well, not a million pieces, but it'll shatter. And then there'll be pieces of shield here and pieces of shield over there. And then you'll be left in the open. You need to know how to use your weapons. And you need to know how and when to strike and how and when to block. And when an attack is too strong, how to dodge and get out of the way. The Bible also speaks about not engaging in a fight. You don't need to fight. There's a lot of that in the Bible. Don't go and fight everything. This is foolish. It says, as much as possible, live at peace with each other. Don't go and just fight with them. Don't go and attack people randomly. 
Right? You go, he's not safe. We'll just need to ter terrorize him to get rid of the problem. Oh, you have a fight with this guy. Oh, he has a bad demeanor. I don't like the way he looked at me. He, their look offends me. <laughs> and so <laughs> Christians tend to attack things that they don't need to attack because they have no wisdom, because they have no knowledge, and they have no understanding. There are different levels to revelation. Can you go back to, uh, to the one where it says there, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and after that it speaks about enlightening, right? So it says, yeah, here we go, that you may get the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of wisdom. The Bible says, firstly, get wisdom. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. You understand God is, is head of everything. You will then gain wisdom. Once you gain wisdom, you then need revelation. That's your second level. So in other words, wisdom is the word of God, right? You, want, you, got, yeah, you believe God and you fear God and he is king over all. You understand that you have great fear of God. You have wisdom. You buy a Bible, you also have wisdom. But how many people do you know that own a Bible and don't have any revelation? How many people do you know own a Bible and misquote scriptures? How many people do you know own a Bible and aren't even saved? Instead, they twist the scripture back at you. You know, un un unsaved people always know that one scripture that says, like, turn the other cheek. <laughs> you know, if I hurt you, you must give me your shirt as well as your jacket. You know, all the, and they give all those scriptures. Like, what's wrong with them, right? But they understand some level of wisdom. But they have, you have the wisdom of God. Level two is a revelation. That means, how did it come about? How does this affect me? You heard about all this amazing scriptures and about all these amazing mysteries in the kingdom, but how does this actually affect me and how do I use it? That's number two. So number one is informational. Number two is applicable, right? Wisdom, uh, one of the uh, definitions of wisdom is applied knowledge. You get wisdom, you got revelation, and you have knowledge. And the fourth word, the next one, tells us enlightening. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. These are four levels of revelation or four levels of understanding things. Paul said, you know, Paul was very upset in, in, with a lot of his church people. That's why he wrote those letters over and over again for them. And he said, I really want to get to the important things. But you guys don't understand basic things. And he said, please leave behind the basic things like laying on of hands and raising the dead and the end time judgment and baptism and faith. Please leave, uh, you, you, you learnt it. Now, but, you, but you, 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 we told it to you, but you didn't learn it. But because you didn't learn it, I can't teach you the real stuff. But people are so uh, absorbed with the level one things that they sit there all the time, all day long, because they, I don't know, like they're children, they keep having milk and not meat. But here you have different levels of enlightening. And depending upon your different levels of understanding, enlightening, and wisdom, and revelation, you then have different levels of authority and power and knowing how to accomplish what you need to do in this life. So now, if I go back to the four Hebrew levels that they wrote about, in understanding all scripture. The first level I said is a literal translation or a literal understanding of the scripture. So you can just read it, but you can have a literal understanding of what's happening. And I did do a previous message where I, I took a piece of scripture and I, and I explained each of the four levels uh, yeah, in, in, uh, you know, from the one scripture, but I'm not gonna go into it right now. But level one is literal understanding. Level two is metaphorical understanding or understanding things on a, uh, or, or on a theoretical basis, understanding things of what he truly meant. One is a literal under understanding, one is a figurative understanding. Level three is the supernatural level. And that, that is considered the one where you can first unlock power, but not the kind of power that you think about. And the last level, and this is my favorite one, and this Hebrew word I know is called sud, S-O-D. 
And the Hebrew word means mystical understanding. And the reason I didn't use the word mystical, I used the word supernatural, uh, is because people, when they hear the word mystical, they think of like, you know, the new age things. <laughs> they think about some guy on a Tibetan mountain floating somewhere, and that's a mystical understanding of all things. So level one, you have a literal understanding, and that level produces a type of understanding, a type of enlightening, a type of revelation that is akin to building faith. And the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to believe God or to please God. And faith is very, very, very important. And if you don't have faith, you have, you lost everything else. It's just basically worthless. Because no faith, your prayer don't work. <laughs> faith makes prayer work. Prayer doesn't make faith work. You keep praying it over and over again. Eventually, you believe it. That's not true. The Bible says, you, we believe, therefore we speak. You must believe it first and then pray for it. You don't speak it over and over again and then say, eventually, I'll believe it myself. I'll contrast it again and again, and eventually, one day, I'll, I'll get it. You get that, that, that's called mental ascension. You're talking yourself into it. The Bible says, first you believe, therefore we speak. David wrote about it, Paul wrote about it. And he says, we having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. When you read something at surface level, you receive a level of faith because the Bible says when you hear scripture spoken or when you hear messages spoken, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So you receive faith by level one literal understanding. Then you can, at just level one, just imagine this for a second. At level one, you have mountain moving power. That's not even like the thing people aspire, you shouldn't even aspire to that. That's like the basic, that's for children. Paul said that, right? He said, please leave behind the basic simple things. Mountain moving power. Things that you're trying to move and, they don't, and, and, and they're like, I keep getting stuck over here. And it's like a mountain. Move the mountain. Level one. <laughs> right? This, if you think about like a video game, you, get, you, you have to keep going from level one to level two. And your level one is, 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 is operating and pushing the mountain out the way. Level one is speaking and it coming to pass. Level one is the blessing of God. And you have to build that base. If you haven't got it before, you got to build that base. And you, you, by faith and patience, you inherit the promise. It's a, it, it is the basis of all things in the word of God. You need to understand that first. And the more you get of it, the more uh, 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 effective you become. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You, there's so many different terms inside there, right? You've got to be effectual. You've got to be fervent, not giving up. Prayer of a righteous person, one who lives righteously, that produces an output. So th 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 this is level one, right? Level one is literal understanding, and the revelation that you receive unlocks a level of power that is attached to faith. All faith-based things come from level one. You get saved. When people get saved, they operate in faith, right? The, the pastor says, anyone believes what God says, the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. When you sp say the salvation prayer that's level one, you operate in faith. One confession separates you from hell to heaven. Jesus saved me and you have been moved from hell, translated to the kingdom of heaven. That's faith. You were saved by faith, right? You confessed it. So level one, mountain moving power, the same way you said, Lord God, save me, is the same way you say, Lord God, help me with this problem, move this guy out the way or do this. That's level one, right? Level two is figurative understanding. And uh, level one, people, there, there, there are millions and billions of, of pastors on level one stuff because they, they, this, it's, it's the bread and butter of, of Christianity, right? Understanding the simple things of the word. This is what Paul said, like, don't go, too, don't, too, don't go away from the simple things, right? Level one. Level two is figurative understanding. Figurative understanding unlocks a level of anointing power. Figurative understanding means laying on of hands power, where you lay hands on things and it affects things. Figurative power is where you understand things on a different level, where you figure out that actually there's a spirit world that's fighting each other. 
and that if there's a spirit world, that that means this problem can't just be attacked with faith. I have to add works to my faith, and I have to go there and attack it from a certain area because there's a spirit or a demon or something that is affecting this problem. Level two unlocks the levels of anointing power. It unlocks you to be able to have your hands being working for God. I have to do something and your hands move on their own. This is the level that people need to get to in order for God to help them when they are doing work or writing exams or, uh, or operating in the kingdom of God or working in the kingdom. You unlock that power by the revelation of figurative understanding. You unlock that power by understanding the meaning of what Jesus was trying to say there. Jesus said, uh, which is easier to say, you are healed of your disease or you are forgiven of your sins. He's saying they are the same thing. You have this power that is a figurative understanding. That's not even like the deep stuff yet. That's just level one, uh, level two. This is where a lot of Christians stop right there. And in fact, a lot of pastors stop over there and it's really disappointing actually. <laughs> They just, they, they stop over there and they were like, well, we just need more anointing. Or we have to find somebody else with an anointing because I tried to pray over it, it didn't work. So let me find somebody else who has a different anointing and they can come in and they can do this. <laughs> As if that person has more power than you. So level two is the one of anointing, right? Level three, level of understanding that you will find is they call it the supernatural understanding or the spiritual understanding. The spiritual understanding is where most charismatic churches sit and most glory churches sit. Spiritual understanding is also commonly used by apostles. Uh, it's most commonly used by apostles. And it is a level where people, once they get the revelation, they can then operate in the glory of God. This is the one where people are like calling down angels and they're opening portals to heaven. And they're worshiping God, and God is giving them blessings and breakthrough. And God gives them a level of authority over areas instead of over just their houses and their things. It's a, it's a place where they can, people are being healed by them walking past, right? Like Peter in the shadow. Uh, most popular people that you, you know operate with this thing and teach about these things are people like, um, like Benny Hinn. Uh, people like um, David Herzog and the rest of them, everyone that speaks about the glory of God are operating on the third level of understanding. This is why you, whenever you hear their messages, they will interpret scriptures entirely differently than somebody else who is speaking mostly about faith. They will look at a piece of scripture and say, like, this is the glory of God, that's the anointing of God, and this is faith. And they will separate it all the time. And they will say, if you want to, you can do all three of them or individual. But you, if you want to operate in this one, you have to understand this way. They are the ones who, uh, uh, you know, when you get to that level of understanding, that's when people start to have like dreams and visions and things like that, right? And they have it all the time. And they are operating in a level of, of, of glory and power that most people never, ever see. The real problem there is that people started to get like really deep in there and started to get creepy to other people. And this is, that's actually why a lot of secret friendly churches came about is because the charismatic people were so aggressive in their supernatural things that people were like, we don't really know, understand this thing. And they went towards the churches that were very normal looking and that created a lot of secret friendly churches uh, because they went too far, right? And now they went too far this direction. And now both sides are now suffering, and now we're trying to bring them back together, right? But there are levels deeper than that. There is actually a level of understanding the scripture which is called mystical understanding, right? It's called sud. Uh, and level four is after people have understanding what the glory of God is, and they understand what the anointing of God is, they then reach into the realm of mystical understanding, is what it says. Mystical understanding is often used by prophets but in the other parts of the Bible, that word appears in different forms as the word mystery. Mystical, mystery, not very difficult now, right? The Bible speaks about mysteries of the kingdom. It is the glory of God for, for, to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to unearth it. A mystical understanding often belongs to, to, to churches and to pastors that not, don't just uh, uh, look for things, 
but they look for the reason why things exist. A lot of people enjoy the anointing and they enjoy the glory of God and don't understand why this person has it and why another person doesn't have it. Or why does it even exist? Most of you don't even ask that question. Why does the glory of God exist? Why does the anointing of God exist? Can't God do it a different way? Why do we need faith if we have the anointing? Why do we need the anointing if we have the glory? Why are there different levels? Why, why can't we just get the full one now? So when they go into the mystical level, you find that people, uh, the, 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 the story is a lot more wide angle than what you can think about it, right? Uh, some pastors call it widescreen. I think uh, they explain about it. But it comes to a time where you uh, uh, go through the scriptures and you find different types, different shadows, and you find patterns that evolve in the Bible. And you find, like, for example, one of the mystical understandings was that the front half of the book mirrors exactly the last half of the Bible. And the very center point is the death and resurrection of Christ. From the resurrection of Christ, everything turns backwards. And the Bible ends the way it starts. And the events unfold in the same way, in the same direction, backwards as it does forward. Uh, mystical understanding is also where people find that Jesus appears in every single Old Testament book and sometimes even in every chapter. Even where you can't see him and you don't understand why he's there, right? Or why certain books are there, right? You know, the book of Esther doesn't name God in there. That like blows people's minds when they, when they figure it out. But you can see Jesus is inside it. He's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So what happens is, mystical understanding allows you to understand where Jesus is in the Old Testament, and then allows you to predict patterns in the future. Uh, two, past, two people are very famous today for understanding this on this level, right? Because uh, some terms for, for, for in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures for understanding are terms like harbinger, terms like different dimensional understandings, uh, terms like uh, times and seasons and types and shadows and, and all these crazy things that people are now very, very um, uh, interested in now, right now today. All the things that people confuse people, right? Things like the different aliens or different forms of angels, where the, the, the different forms of giants and things like that, different forms of, of spirits and fallen angels and stuff. That's all considered under mystical understandings because they are hidden inside the names of people. And, uh, and in the name of every person in the Bible is a story. Everyone's name means something, and it predicts their life. That's a, uh, even like Balaam, right? His name means something, and there's a, there's a, it predicts the outcome of what happens, right? Even, even today, people who are in power, uh, their names mean something, right? So, for example, the, the name Biden, we know our president, U.S. President Biden, in Hebrew, his name means, alas, the judgment has come. <laughs> or alas, judgment is coming. Like, we don't know what to say, but judgment is coming now. <laughs> and that's what it means. So when everyone call him, when they say President Biden, they say, President, oh no, it looks like judgment's going to come upon us. The number 45 means, how can this, bi this guy be in power? <laughs> how can this happen? When President Trump came into power as president number 45, they said, how did he win? How did he come into power? So when they say the 45th president, they say, why is he in power? How can this happen? What happened? So the two famous pastors that are actually, uh, 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 that, that are really deep in this level of, of understanding is Jonathan Kahn, and the other one that I learned from many years ago is Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler was the pastor back in 2008 who explained to people that aliens are fallen angels. He also explained from the Bible the 10 different dimensions with the scripture references and how you can actually access different dimensions through the word of God <laughs> and you can actually affect different dimensions using your laptop. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it, there were deep, very, very deep stuff that most would blow people's mind. He explained from the Bible how when demonic creatures come inside, like alien ships, for example, how they can make right angle turns at high speed which defy the laws of physics. How is that possible? The Bible explains that, if you didn't know. 
So these are called mystical understandings. Now, if you're trying to figure that out, I'll give you the answer quickly so you're not, con you're not like you know, thinking about it when I'm teaching the rest of the stuff. Uh, the reason it can flip like that is because they are hyperdimensional creatures, not interstellar. Hyperdimensional means they can flip between dimensions rapidly, which allows them to change directions. Uh, and the Bible explains that anything that doesn't have a body does not exist in our dimension. So if it can flip in and out of, of existence, it can turn its body on and off, uh, and it, it, it gets, gets more and more crazy and detailed, right? But this is, the, you know, the stuff about Bigfoot and things like that. Uh, but uh, there are some really, really deep teachings. You can understand that later on if you want to go through it. But, uh, and the different, and he also explains how people are healed and the difference between eternity and infinity. There's a, there's a separation, the Bible explains. The difference between the world and the earth, right? There are two, that one contains the universe and its subsystems. The other one is just the earth. Uh, and uh, these are all explained in the Bible, right? And these are all deep level stuff with the word of God. Chuck Mislow is also the guy who found out in Hebrew that the, uh, the Bible has an error correcting code. From the front to the back, the name of God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, right? Uh, appears in Hebrew from the front to the middle every so many uh, numbers, uh, so many numbers of uh, letters, right? And it names, so the word of God is God himself. It keeps saying Yahweh, 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 every few letters all the way to the center in Hebrew, and then it says something else, and then from the center to the back, it says Yahweh, but in reverse, H-W-H-Y, <laughs> And then he said, well, we found this out. We found that the Bible has error-correcting code. And if anyone tries to add or remove scriptures, even in English, the code corrects itself. It doesn't work. You can't translate the word like that. Uh, there's a whole lot of other deep levels of understanding. Uh, and this is where you need, to, uh, you, need, you need to pick this thing up, right? You see, that kind of stuff, when people listen to it, when people are not on the level, when I say not on the level, I mean things like um, you, you, are, you are not on the fourth level or you're not on the third level, the response of all Christians are the same. That's interesting. That's good to know. That's the answer that tells, that tells God and tell, that you can tell yourself that you don't get it. If your response is, that seems very informative, it means, go back to the previous line over here, it means that you are still on level one, which is wisdom. You have a Bible, you don't understand it. And you're thinking like, well, what, what do you mean about that? Well, let me, let me tell you about the last one, right? The one where it says at the front of the Bible to the middle of the Bible spells the name of God. Did you know there's a consequence to understanding that? That's written in the Word of God, in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, right in the beginning, tells us that if you read the book, then you can understand it and you are blessed in a certain manner. The end of the book of Revelation tells us something very, very important, right? It says, if you add anything to the Word, that, that what you added will come upon you. All of, the, sorry, all of the plagues in the Bible, on the book of Revelation, will all come upon you. This is uh, Revelation 22, verse 18. 22, verse 18. It says, if you mess with the word of God, you will cause the plagues to all come upon you. So what does it have to do with Y-H-W-H throughout the world. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, the next one it says us, if anyone takes away from the words of this book or this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What does this mean? Well, the Bible is God himself. When you add something, you are perverting the name of God. You have committed blasphemy. When you've committed blasphemy, you've done it against God himself, the name of God. You have blasphemed the name of God by adding or removing things from the texts. 
you have caused all of the judgment of God to fall upon you. That's what the last section of that means. This is why the word of God says, Yahweh to the center and Yahweh to the end. He is the beginning and the end. He is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah, that who was, that who is, and that is which to come. So what happens is when you have different levels of understanding, you have people who say it's important or that seems interesting, but if you don't understand why it's there or how God put it there or why did he even make us aware of the certain things, you won't access the power to put it into your own life. Today, people use that form of error-correcting code. It's called CRC checks all over technology. Every disc, you know, we used to have CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays. And Every disc has the same CRC check inside it. Every so many bits, it must give an answer. And we use that same error-correcting code in all things today. Uh, in all technology, when you send something over Wi-Fi, before anything installs, it does that same error-correcting code check inside it to ensure that you have received that which is everything in the Word of God. This is one of the ways that we know the Bible has not been perverted. Because if any book was missing, the code would not work. If any book was added or removed, this is why, excuse me, this is why certain books in, uh, in other people's Bibles, they have the Apocrypha, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the hidden books of the Bible, the Maccabees books and those books. When those books are added, the code doesn't work. When you add the book of Enoch, the Bible doesn't work no more. That's why it's not part of the Bible. It's a separate book. It's not the word of God. It is a history book. That's why the book of Yasha is not there, even though it's highly accurate. You, and the book of Maccabees is, is, is actually a very, very important book, if you think about it, because Jesus celebrates Hanukkah. And if Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, we should too. The Bible tells us this. Hanukkah is known as a season of miracles. It's one week where unexpected miracles will take place every day in a new fashion. That's why they light the candles. If you guys don't know Hanukkah, they have a menorah, right? And every day they sing a song and they light the first candle. The next day they sing a song and they light the second candle. And then the, the third day, all the way every day of the week. Because every day brings a new, never before seen miracle. That's what it means. So you're supposed to receive a miracle that is impossible every single day for seven days. That's the time of miracles. And Jesus celebrated it. So if you just heard about it, or you just saw someone do it, or you just saw them light it, you wouldn't understand it. And most Christians don't even know what Hanukkah is. Hanukkah was the rebuilding of the temple of God. It was a restoration miracle. And it was a time of war and a time of judgment all at the same time. God did everything in seven days. The entire country was pagan. Only one family, the Maccabee family, decided to stand for God, and they defeated an entire army by themselves. The entire Greek army that came against them, they killed all of them, defended them, took over the temple, killed all the prophets of Baal, all the prophets of Zeus, uh, all the, um, so say, all the, uh, uh, um, not, not prophets, the uh, altars of Baal, altars of Zeus, all these things were inside the temple of God. They destroyed everything, kicked it out, and then found out they only have enough oil for one day. And they said, we can't do this. And then God multiplied the oil every single day for seven days while the same family rebuilt the temple and fought the enemy at the same time. Their food didn't run out, their oil didn't run out. And that's why they said, for seven days, the power and the glory of God multiplied miracles every day. That's why it's called the season of miracles. So that book is very important, right? Because it tells the story of what happened and how the Maccabees fought and how, the, I don't even know how this is even possible, but apparently it is, and I didn't want to research it. But you find that historically, people who were saved undid the circumcision. And I, I didn't want to find out exactly how that's possible. <laughs> but it says they undid the circumcision so that they became unsaved. Only the Maccabee family said, no, we're not doing that. And they said, we are children of God, chosen people. And they, uh, they, 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 they rebuilt the temple of God. 
It's a very important season, very important time. But it's not in the Bible because it's not the physical word of God. And you can tell, because if it was added, you would have this kind of problem. Attack people. All of the plagues will come upon them. <laughs> That's why they say it is, Aprokata means hidden scriptures. Scriptures that are not part of the Bible. It is alongside the Bible. It is a hidden text. It's not meant for everyone to read. It's like it's not part of the word that God has. It's a separate section. It's its own thing, right? Parallel literature. So when you have different levels of understanding, level one understanding is it exists. Thank God, literal understanding. It is literally physical. It's there. Fine. Level two is why does it exist? How can I use it? That's anointing power. Level three unlocks the glory of God in your house and in all things. And then you say, not just how it exists or why it exists, but why does this person have it at this time? And how come it happens in this manner? That's level three. Level four is how do I recreate it myself? How do I be like God? Because you are equal to God. Did you know that the Bible tells you that? When you call yourself a son of God, the Bible says you are equal to God. Jesus said, I am the son of God. He put it in there. And the Pharisees said, by him saying this, he made himself equal to God. If you are equal to God, that means you can create a universe. If you have the power of God inside you that raised Christ from the dead, you can recreate new forms of life. And the Bible speaks about that. Because we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to create new worlds. But people are so busy, they're sitting there trying to move a mountain. Level one is, so, is all these, these people sit there. That's like milk and meat stuff is your faith. <laughs> it's like so important. But they haven't progressed past it. When you hear something incredible from the word of God, and when you hear something that it seems interesting, but I don't understand it, it means you have not attained that level of understanding. And if you haven't attained that level of understanding, you don't have that level of power inside you. Or you have it, but it's misaimed. You keep missing over and over again. You know, the Bible says to create new forms of plant life by speaking. Jesus tells us to do that. He says, tell the tree to uproot itself and plant itself underwater to become a new species. If anyone says to this mulberry tree, be thou uprooted and be planted underwater. In other words, become a new species of plant and become a creator like the creator God himself. That's what it means to have the faith of God. You need to go to a whole new levels, right? The Bible speaks about interstellar travel. The Christians are the ones who are supposed to be doing these things. And Jesus expresses frustration with it and says, the people who are unsaved are more wiser than those who are saved. Did you see that? They are more shrewd than them. You should learn from them. Do you guys remember that scripture? Right? We, we can go to that because that was such an amazing scripture for me, right? It says, uh, he tells a parable. And the parable is, uh, and you can, you can find it and put it on the screen, right? But I'm going to tell the parable in the meanwhile. It's a parable about a servant who uh, didn't do his job and then he was going to get fired. And the master said, I'm going to come there and fire him next week. Uh, because he's got, you know, so many days left on his work contract, that kind of a thing happening going on, right? And so the servant says, oh no, what am I going to do? I don't want to live on the streets. He says that because I need this job. I have no money, right? He says there was a certain man who with the steward who was accusing him, brought him, brought him wasting his goods. Okay, there we go, right? So this guy, he's a really bad manager. He go and get fired. Let's look at the next one. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward, right? 
you, you, you uh, irresponsible leader, right? You went so far over the budget that you cost the company so much. That's what's happening here. You d I gave you this project five months ago. Nothing is done, right? So in other words, pack your office. Let's look at the next one. Then the steward said with himself, what shall I do? My master is going to take my stewardship, going to take my job away. I cannot dig. I can't do manual labor. I can't become a dog. I can't beg. He has no savings. He has no, he has to have his job to survive. And said, I cannot dig. In other words, I can't do manual labor. Because this guy was a manager. Remember, he's a white collar guy. He got no strength to become a, <laughs> become a trench digger. He's like, I can't do gardening. I can't be a, a domestic worker. I, I, I have this reputation of mine. And I, and I, I, I can't be, a, I, people will know me if I try and beg on the street. I'm famous. Look at the next one. I have resolved what to do when I am put out of stewardship. They may receive me into their houses. In other words, I have a plan. It's not a good plan, but it works. I have a plan. Let's look at the next one. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? So now he's calling all the people that he worked with. He's now calling all of the master's contacts, everyone that worked with the master before, every, all the master's clients, right? Because he's in charge of managing the master's clients. He's calling all his clients behind the master's back, Look at the next one. And he says, how much do you owe him? And they said, 100. And he said, here, take your bill and you write down 50. In other words, they are coming in the next couple of minutes. But if you write down that you only owe 50, I'll give you a 50% discount. Now he's causing more destruction to his master, right? He is now, <laughs> he, he was already responsible. But he's like a real slime ball, right? You know, he's like a proper snake. Now he's like, well, in order to protect myself, he's like a, like a weasel, you know? He's like, I'm going to give you a 50% discount. Just come over here and quickly write this down. Look at the next one. He says, I'm going to make friends with all these guys with all these borrowed money. How much do you owe? And he says, 100 measures of wheat. He said, take your bill, write down 80. I'm giving you a 20% discount. <laughs> I like you. And this is my last day at work, so I'm going to give you 20% discount. <laughs> Look at the next one. Is that the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, intelligently. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. In other words, this guy was so smart, what he did was wrong, but he was intelligent because all these people that he gave discounts to are now his pals. At least one of them will give him a job. At least one of them will help him. Because he helped them by giving them a 50% discount. That's incredible. So they're going to help him. He's a, he's a buddy now. He's, I've got a buddy, and if anything happens, I'll go to one of these different guys, and they will help me. And Jesus is here saying that these people, they did wrong, but they were more intelligent than the rest of them, than you guys in the church, because you guys want to be all passive and not progress and not break through and build new things. Look at the next one. I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. This is a scripture that people don't quote very often. Then when you fail, because one day you will fail at something, they may receive you into an everlasting home. In other words, use your filthy, disgusting money and pay people off. <laughs> take your money and make friends with it. Buy from people and make friends with them. Give them money, buy them gifts. Because when you need help, they will come to your rescue. These are not righteous people. It says make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. Use the cash that you have to build a reputation. Because when things go wrong, they will give you a place to crash forever. <laughs> you help them, they will now help you. 
There was a, I told you about this before. I was driving the road and the, the back of this taxi said there, when days are dark, friends are few. That's because you didn't make enough friends. <laughs> and you were stingy with cash when you had so much. Now when you desperately need help, they are stingy with cash. If you go over there and you keep on helping one family over and over again, when you need help, they will help you. That's what it means here. So you have different levels of understanding. You have level one understanding, which is be a good business person. Then you have level two understanding, which is build a reputation with that person so that when you fail, it will assist you. Level three understanding that you can go inside is it says unrighteous mammon. You see, unrighteous mammon can only be made righteous by two methods, either by giving it to God as an offering or by giving it away. You have to release it for it to become righteous. You have to tithe off of it and then it becomes righteous. The Bible speaks about that. Or give it away. In other words, you have no actual use for it. Money is a tool. Use it to build that which cannot fail. Build a reputation, right? There are some things, in other words, there are some things more valuable than money. That's what it means. Unright That's why it says, un it, it could have just said money. But he said unrighteous mammon. Why did he say that? How did he put it there for this reason? Go deeper into the scriptures. There are some things more valuable than money. And those things are everlasting. You can, next, and the next level, this is more, you can go even deeper, right? Into the supernatural meanings and understandings now. You can now use physical objects to purchase supernatural spiritual things. You can use physical cash to buy spiritual homes. Jesus explains this as well. Jesus said, use your own money to provide for yourselves purses in heaven. You can buy land in heaven with physical money on earth. It's not preached very often. Don't store here on earth. Instead, give it away so that you can store up for yourself in heaven where moth and rust cannot get to it and thieves don't break in and steal. They are some things more valuable than cash. But the level three, the glory connection, the glory understanding of the scripture is there are things more valuable than money and you can buy it with money. There's a, there's a scripture that's not quoted very often, but it teaches people in the book of Proverbs, teaches Christians how to bribe people correctly. Did you know that? <laughs> there's a right way and a wrong way to bribe people. And if you're a Christian, there's a right way and a wrong way to receive a bribe. And you're like, no, bribing is wrong. Read it again, please. We just learned about bribing over here, right? This guy bribed all of his people, right? The Bible says if you bribe the right person in the book of Proverbs, it will open the right door for you. And it says if there's no room for you, give them a bribe and you'll have room. In other words, and one pastor, uh, he was a very, very famous pastor who said this, he did so well. He said, how do you understand this? It's very easy. You go to a restaurant and you forgot to make a reservation. You give him some money, and then you have a reservation. <laughs> That's in the Bible. Another one, a scripture. Very, everyone knows the scripture. It's very simple. It says, your gift will make room for you. The word gift is specifically the word bribe. Your bribe will make a room for you. You need to go somewhere. You need to do something, and you can't get inside there. If you bribe it correctly, you will have room. That's a scripture. But a lot of people will see it as immoral or, uh, what's the word, uh, wrong, right? It's wrong, it's not, it's not fair, and all these things. The Bible actually says this, if someone is in power, they should never take a bribe. 
And it also says if someone is in authority, they shouldn't take a bribe. But it also explains that making a bribe is not a sin. If you are the one paying it, it's also not wrong. But if you are an authority, you can't receive it. In other words, you can't bribe like a senator or something like that. <laughs> you can't bribe like a policeman. That's not allowed. That's immoral. And he says you can't bribe like someone, like a king or someone in, the, in authority. That you should not do. But other kinds of bribes, which people do in business all the time, called commission, <laughs> is allowed. And, but you should not receive it as well. If you're in authority over that person, they give you a bribe to let them off of a crime they just did. That's not right. That's immoral. You should not do that, right? You're a judge, and then the guy is bribing you. No. <laughs> That's wrong. But here, he's showing a different form of shrewdness by bribing people in order to receive an everlasting home. Now, I, I'm not going to preach more about the bribing thing. You can go and learn about that for yourself, right? Because it's like, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it gets really, really deep the more you study it, right? Uh, and, uh, and things like that. But you have different levels of understanding. And you need to make friends around you using the cash that you have so that you become more powerful. So that you create a reputation and you create friends in high places so that when you fail, you don't actually fail. You just fall into a pillow. You just go one side to the other. You can then protect yourself and that means when you fail, you don't feel the effects of the failure. There's actually more, even, a, even more deeper meaning to this whole thing. There's a, there's a mystical level of understanding and stuff like that. But we're not going to go into that one today because the more you preach about these things, if the people aren't on that level, then they won't get it. And if they won't get it, then they'll just say it's interesting. And they won't understand why these things exist. Let's look at the next one. It says, he who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Jesus is giving another figurative translation to his parable. He who is unjust in least is unjust also in much. Now he says, that guy there in the back, which you just learned now, the, uh, the manager, he was unfaithful in his first job. The, the boss came to fire him and then he became unjust in much. Why? Because he then crooked all of the books. So he caused his master further disruption. He was unjust a little, now he's unjust in much. This is also a teaching about how Satan operates, right? When Satan is stealing from most people, he steals slowly, little bits, little bits, little bits. But when he gets caught, he then begins to attack the person who then caught that demon. Right? This is why when people are sick all the time, and then they learn in the, in, the, in the scriptures that no sickness can come upon this body, all of a sudden they are much more sick than they were before. Because he's going to be evicted. You just learned that you can have prosperity and all your needs are fulfilled, right? I shall lack nothing because he is according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Yes, amen, you take that word and then something happens on your car and you have to have an unexpected expense. Because the bad servant is being kicked out. So he was unjust a little, now he's going to be unjust in much. So you have to defeat that demon instead of letting it discourage you. Because otherwise, he's just going to stay in power and continue stealing from you. But most Christians, after they, ex they receive this revelation of God, they are like, yes, I, I don't need to, 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 to be in lack ever again. Nothing of mine will break down. You just heard a, a sermon from Catherine during, during offering. It's a very important sermon. It says, by faith and by tithing, nothing of yours should ever stop working. Nothing of yours should ever break down. It doesn't matter how old it is. It doesn't matter what model it is. It should never, ever, ever, by the spirit and blessing of God, never stop working. And I've seen this in our own life. People are like, this thing should have stopped working like years ago. The lifespan of this thing is one year. 
It's going for 20 years plus. That's how we, we, we still have things. <laughs> I have things in our house. They were like, the, like this should have died a long time ago. Well, the curse that is upon people causes things to die early. The blessing of God causes things to last everlasting. As long as you're a tither, your car should never, ever, 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 ever break down in any way, shape, or form. Your aircon should not get dirty over time and produce a weird smell. That's what it means. That's what the rights of a tither means. The rights of a tither also means that your child should never become sick or never miscarry a child. It's a right of a tither. But if you don't understand it, you will let it happen. But now that I've told you that great revelation, it's now no longer, when Catherine came up, people were like, that's very interesting. That's a very, very informative uh, in, uh, offering message. It's very, very good. But they just heard it. They didn't understand it. And they didn't understand it because they had no knowledge. And they didn't have, and because they had neither, they had no enlightening. It's four levels of discussion that comes through it. You got to go in and ask, why are certain words in a certain order? That's what it means to go deeper. And after you ask, why is it there? Who has got it? Why do certain people have it? And then how do I get it? And the last level is, how do I be like God and recreate these circumstances? How do I create? I don't just want to follow. I don't just want to examine. I don't just want to be a scientist and observe. Be the one who creates. Be the one that people uh, uh, study in the future. <laughs> he who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. This is a very, very simple law. Level one, literal understanding is very simple. You're faithful little, you'll be faithful in much. Level two, figurative understanding is spiritually. If you are faithful in what is that which is spiritual, when people are not looking and you're reading your word of God, when you are praising God before the victory, you are faithful in little. Then you will be faithful in much. Second half, in the unjust in that what is least, unjust was in much. When Satan is being evicted, Satan retaliates and attacks you in that which you professed. Always, and I'm going to, this is like a warning to many people, right? Because they also, they don't know this. The Bible explains, and Paul writes this and writes it in detail. He says, when you have finally received a revelation. In other words, you read the scripture and you got a level one, two, three, or even four revelation. You understand it. You know you've got it because Paul says immediately a demon attacks you. Jesus writes, he said, if you, you receive a level one uh, the, the word of God, which is the seeds that are scattered upon the ground. He said the sower sows the words. He throws the seeds upon the ground. Immediately birds come to eat the seed. Demon spirits come to steal it. He makes people tired. He makes them weary. He makes them distracted. Level one, right? That spirit, once you've got the revelation, that spirit comes to take it from them. Level two is that when the seed comes up, it starts to grow. Weeds come in and the cares of the world choke it and pull it down. That means as it's growing and you're understanding things on a second, a deeper level, God will, uh, God, Satan will distract you with things of the world, bills you have to pay, things happening outside, your children fighting with each other, everything around you, your work will continuously pound you with work over and over again. And that's how it's steeled and sucked. That's the spirit of Satan the demons retaliating to you understanding the word of God is you being crushed under work and too tired or too sick. You are finally understanding it, finally getting it, but now you have too much work to think about it. That is a demonic attack. Book of Exodus teaches us the same thing. When the people received the word of God, then Pharaoh doubled the workload so that they weren't able to attend services or listen to prophecy. It says that. It's a level two attack. It's a demonic attack. Let's look at the next one. It says here, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? 
Level one is very simple, right? Understanding over here. If you're not going to be faithful with regular cash, you won't be faithful when you have actual huge amounts of money. Uh, what they said, if you, if, you, if you won't tie 10 cents on every rand, you won't tie 100,000 on every million. There's no difference. If you, don't, if you aren't faithful in little, you won't be faithful in a lot. But then there's a deeper meaning. It says here, if you won't be unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, the figurative meaning, the level two meaning is, if you can't be faithful here on earth, you will not receive heavenly riches. Who will commit to you the trust of true riches? Unrighteous mammon, if you want, I'll give you one bit of the uh, mystical meaning, right? Unrighteous mammon is also a form of simulated wealth. In other words, it is not real. You live in a simulation. The Bible tells you that. Everything you see, touch, hear, taste, and feel, all that stuff doesn't exist. The unseen world controls the real world. What God is saying here is, in a deeper, much more meaning is, all the money you have now in your pocket doesn't actually exist. It is a simulated form of wealth. And if I can't trust you with something that has no consequence, and I can't trust you with something that doesn't actually exist, it is play money. How can I trust you with actual real gold in heaven where the money is not simulated but is real? Your physical world does not exist. It is a, an illusion, right? And if you can't be trusted with an illusion... I'm definitely not trusting you with the real thing. <laughs> Everything you own physically on this earth is an illusion. The Bible speaks about that. And whatever is going to exist over here is going to be burnt to crisp. And when you die, you, you take nothing with you because it doesn't exist. But the scoreboard does exist. Everything you give to somebody else, that is recorded. That's on the scoreboard. How you play the game matters. You know, if you want to think of it as a more modern term, it doesn't matter how many bullets you have in your gun, it matters how many enemies you kill on the battlefield. You must be, if you aren't faithful with what you have that's not real, God will not give you real gold, real houses, and real wealth because it does exist. It's just not here. It's in heaven. I'll tell you a place that's very, very poor in the supernatural. It's hell because no one has anything down there. That's like a communist hellhole over there. <laughs> in hell, no one owns anything. There's only suffering. And that's all real. All the burning fire, all the demons, all the worms that eat people. The Bible says there are small maggot worms that eat you from the top and one huge long worm that goes up your spine and eats you from inside and swirls in the back of your body and eats you that way. So you have one, you have like a lot of little ones in front and one big one in the back. That's while it causes you to remember the things you did wrong. So it's, as it's eating you, it causes nightmares. That's real. The maggots you have that appear when you leave your bread out for too long, not real. That's a fake one. Real maggots eat human flesh. <laughs> you are like the bread. <laughs> and that thing, you know what's amazing? The fire doesn't kill it. It makes it stronger. Because the Bible says, when the fires of hell come, your skin burns off, and then it reconstitutes itself. And then it burns off again. And then it reconstitutes itself. Every half second. And then it speaks about the gnashing of teeth. It says, the pain is so much, people grind their teeth. You know they grind their teeth? When they, when they grind it so hard, the teeth shatter in their mouth. That's what it means, the gnashing of the teeth. 
because it keeps biting the teeth so hard that it shatters and then it grows back immediately. And this happens over and over again for eternity. That's real. Your current teeth is not real. So you have things that are real and not real. And how you operate in things that are fake here on the earth, nothing matters, will determine how things will matter for your life eternally. If you are not faithful with simulation cash, with e-bucks, <laughs> and uh, you know, V-bucks and all the video game currency, you're not going to be faithful with real money. Right? Let me give you another example, right? Give you another example. You guys have been to that uh, game, uh, what's those people? What's those, uh, no, those arcades. You know the ones that they normally have them in the casinos, the arcades, like the magic company, and you go over there and you buy tokens, and then you play, everyone plays that spider stomping game, the dance dance revolution game. Do, 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 do. I'm not actually going to dance on the stage, don't worry. But, <laughs> but they jump, or they do the one where they shoot the little, you know, the things, and they throw the basketball through there, right? They give you play cash. You put real money in, and then you get 50 little tokens out, right? You put 50 rand in, you get one, if it's one rand a token, you get 50 little silver tokens. And then you go to the machine, it says, insert five tokens. Cling, cling, cling. And it goes, da -da -dum, game, start now, right? Do you know that was created by the guy who created Atari, right? In America, it's called Chuck E. Cheese. It was created as to teach children how to gamble. It was created as a children's casino. That's why the lights all flash and they go, da ding, da ding, ding, just like the real casino. And they bring you food, just like the real casino. <laughs> And you sit there and you keep on trying this game over and over again, like a real casino. But they give you play money, and that's why they let the children run free in there. Can you imagine for a second if it was not tokens, but real cash? And you go over there and you go like, oh my goodness, seven ran a game? I don't need to play this game. This game is like from the 90s. I have a real computer at home. I could play a better game on my iPad or something. You're like, I download the free version of Fruit Ninja on my phone. I don't need to pay five tokens. And then what I'm going to win? I'm going to ticket. And I need 50,000 tickets to get a little teddy bear. You're out of your mind. <laughs> it was a simulation to teach children how to become a gambling addict. It is a true story. You can research it. And this is why you'll find there's always two types of games. You have skill games, and then you have luck-based games. The skill games are very simple, right? They're based upon the amount of skill that you have. They are the basketball game. There is the spider stomping game. It is the dance dance revolution game. It is, um, you know, the one where you shoot the, do the ball into the mouth of the little clown dude to smash his teeth out games. You know, all those games were the ones where you shoot them and throw things and stuff like that. Those are skill games. All the prizes are always capped around 20 tickets. Because it's meant to draw you into the store with skill-based games. It creates an illusion in people's minds that the games, all the games in this arena are all based on skill. It's not true. Only 10% of the games are like that, right? Uh, another 10% of games are games that have no output. In other words, games that are arcade games just for fun. In other words, the one where you ride the bike and the one where you drive the car, and like Metal Slug, and the, you know, the old arcade games like you know, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, and stuff like that. You just play the game, and you get no tickets from it. That's to draw people in there. 80% of the games, and the ones that give you unlimited tickets are all luck-based games. Luck-based games includes the one where the light spins like this, right? And it goes around, and you have to smash that hammer when it uh, goes above the certain light so that you win the jackpot tickets. Uh, what, they, what do they call it? The, the, that lightning one. It goes, ring, ring, ring. And you must hit it with re reaction. Go and read the paper for that, right? I did. It says there, it doesn't matter whether the person hit it on there or not, even if they have a machine that hits it exactly within one one thousandth of a second, it will miss because the machine is calibrated so that only one in so many billion players or games will win the jackpot even if they miss it. It's the same as pulling the lever on the one-armed bandit. You have the same odds of winning that game 
as you have of winning a triple seven jackpot. It is a gambling game, right? The other one is the one where you have all the coins in the front and it's got a little waterfall, you know, on the front here. And then you've got to put the coin and it goes, doo -doo, doo -doo, like this over and over again. And it's like, the coins are going to fall over. If I dash this machine, it'll fall. And you're like, let's drop one token and they'll just knock everything over and they'll fall to the bottom. That's another luck-based game. Because the way that it works is you actually need to input a certain amount of coins before it ever falls over. The one that I was actually good at is there's one where you have a conveyor belt, right? And I actually won quite a lot of tokens with this one because it was the only uh, luck-based game that had some skill in it. You have a con conveyor belt and you have to drop a token through and the token fall goes through like a thing and then it falls on the conveyor belt. And if it lands on the little square, you get that many tickets. It's also a luck-based game because they, the speed at which it comes down varies depending upon the, the machine. So you can't actually guess, if, 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 if you just missed it, you'll also just miss it again and again and again when you come through. Because the way that machine, it changes the speed at which the token comes down. So it's also a luck-based game. So what happens is you come in and then you learn and you become absorbed with these skill-based games and then you were like, well, let me try these bigger games. And then you become a gambling addict. Because you keep trying. This one. The other one is the crane game. You remember the crane game? The manual for the crane game says every few million tokens, then it will catch a thing, a person, a uh, toy. And uh, there are tricks to like, you know, get it to catch more often and stuff like that. But the manual says you, you actually, the owner of the machine puts in how often it catches. And even if you miss, if you are the person, it will still catch a toy and drop it for you. Th right? Go, go and find it. It is a training system to train people, children, to become gambling addicts and to believe that the world is operated off luck. And then you then take those tickets and then you buy an entirely overpriced thing <laughs> from the ticket booth thing. Right? Because that's your bonus, right? You won a prize. This is your prize. So why am I talking about this? Well, because this is what Jesus says is happening here. If you are not faithful with token money, <laughs> I'm not going to give you real money. Because how you play the game matters. If you cheat, at the spider stomping game and you have all five of your family members all press the button as soon as it goes red, you will cheat at everything in life. <laughs> I told Kat, I was like, we are cheating, this is wrong. This is wrong, Catherine. And they were like, no, no, you just push these two buttons and this one on the floor. And mom will be on this side. And the other cousin's on this side. And they were like, this is my button, this is your button. And then the second we go, we'll all go, D -d 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 stomp all the buttons. I said, this is wrong. You are, <laughs> you are cheating with unrighteous mammon. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what your score is, you only get seven tickets out of that thing. Did you notice? And I'm like, let me, let me try something else. What about the basketball one? It doesn't matter, people have high scores at basketball one. It still only gives them like seven, uh, 10 tickets, I think it is. Right? The, uh, uh, Dad, <laughs> Dad is so tall, his arm goes inside the, you know, the, the hole, uh, the thing, right? So one day he was like, let me see how we can get He took the ball and he went like this. <laughs> you know, through the sensor. And it was like a few hundred. <laughs> and it still gave him 20 tickets. If you're not faithful with token money and with tickets, God's not going to give you real cash. Because how you play that game is how you play all the games. Right? This is a deeper level of time. There's another one It says, oh yeah, this, this is the next one, right? Now, my, uh, my, uh, my dad said this to me uh, many, many times every time he asked me to clean something or do something for him. And I said, why should I do this? And he said, if you have not been faithful with that which is another man's or another's, who will give you what is your own? In other words, if you don't clean my car, why should I buy you one? <laughs> if you don't take care of someone else's machine or car or whatever they lend you or they let you stay in someone else's house, you're renting in someone else's house, it's someone else's house. 
if you're not faithful with that, God's not going to give you your own one. God is expounding on the initial message. He's going deeper each time. This was a sermon about people in the world being too wise for their own good. And now Jesus is going deeper in the sermon. He's trying to pull people in to deeper meanings. If you're not been faithful with little, you're going to be faithful with much. And then if you're not faithful with that which is fake, you won't be faithful. No one will give you that which is real. Now he's saying, let's go further. If you're not faithful with what belongs to another person, I'm not going to give you your own one. And there's one more. No servant can serve two masters. Now he's going even deeper. Can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now he's saying it doesn't just matter with cash. It also matters with time. The amount of time you spent on one thing will determine who your master is. And you can either have the master of your job or you can have the master of God. Which one do you spend more time with? Because to serve a master means to work a full day. Do you work nine to five for your job and then spend no time with God? Then you are, your God is now money. That's what it means here. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. There's only two outcomes when you spend so much of time with something. You cannot serve God and mammon. You have a decision to make. Which is more important? Because there will come a time when you'll have to decide between having your job or going to church or being, going for this meeting or going here. And God's going to ask you, which one are you going to pick? You'll be loyal to one, and you'll hate the other one because you say, why can't you have this meeting on a different day? Why do I have to come here for this thing? I can't come here to church now tonight. We have, uh, I have got this work thing to do tomorrow. For children, they say, I can't come to church. I have to study. Which one is more important, God or your job? Because you study to get a job. You're serving mammon too, right? Which one is more important, learning from God or learning from the world's fake system. That's why it says the word mammon. Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve what, that which is a simulation? Which one is more important? Because you'll have to pick one day where you won't be able to pick job or business and church or God. You'll have to make a decision. God is saying it's not just cash it's also time that you pay. You pay attention. It's a currency. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard these things and were deri they derided him. Remember I said once you receive revelation, a demon attacks you? The demon of money attacked Jesus. The demon of people who uh, said, let's not do something today because we all have to do work today, so let's cancel this instead of doing what God asked them to do. They now came against Jesus. The people who put cash instead of God. Let's go to the next one. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is esteemed highly among men is an abomination in the sight of God. In other words, if it is valuable to those in the world, God finds it evil. What the world finds valuable, God finds evil. Now, I, I, we've run out of time, actually, but I was going to teach you something a lot more deeper in this, uh, this part over here. Katie, you can come up and you can do something over here. Close in prayer. There is a much, much deeper message over here. Those who justify yourselves before men, God knows your heart. When you have to explain it, God is not in it. When you have to explain it to somebody, why you can't make it, God is not in it. When you have to explain to your child why you couldn't come to their sports game, 
or something like that. Because you had a work thing. It's an abomination to God. When you have to explain it to your spouse why you can't go out together tonight because you actually have to finish a project, God is not in it. When you justify it, God is not there. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's your level one understanding. I'm not a, we, we, we ran out of time. I was going to teach something a little bit more deeper here, but it's okay. Maybe we'll do it next week. Gregory. Amen. Let's stand because we're going to close the service in prayer tonight. And uh, from what I remember, I think I recovered from the delegation of family members to <laughs> effectively do the spider stomping game. <laughs> from what I remember, maybe wrong. <laughs> but let's, let's pray tonight. And if you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, as we learned, you can either serve, uh, uh, you, there's only two masters, one or the other, right? And Pastor Dave said something very powerful when we spoke about how this life, is a simulation, right? I learned from another pastor, and he said, if you told somebody, another way to understand eternity is if you told somebody the way you live the next 24 hours determines how you will live the rest of your life, what would you do in that 24 hours? And he said, it's the same way with eternity. The way that we live today, our life on this earth, determines what happens and how we live and where what God gives to us, uh, uh, you know, besides just salvation and escaping hell, how you live today will determine how, many, how you're going to live in heaven, how big is your house, because not everybody has the same house. Not everybody has the same rewards, the same crown, the same robes. Um, not everybody has the same uh, level of authority or reigning, because we all reign with Christ. First, we have to qualify to reign. And then you need to know how many cities or towns or maybe nations God's going to give to you. So how you live today is so important. So if you're here and you need to rededicate or give your life to Jesus for the first time, you want to go to heaven and you want to live the life that God has for you, I want you to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I accept you into my life as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I give you my life my family, and all of me. I believe you died for me on the cross. You were dead and buried, and three days later, you rose from the dead. I receive your gift of the Holy Spirit, my helper and my guide, and I receive the power of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray, that you'll make yourself real to me. And I pray for revelation knowledge and understanding. Holy Spirit, I ask that you interpret the scriptures for me, that you will give me understanding of all that salvation brings. I thank you, Lord, that I will live for you. Lord, show me my destiny. And God, I choose to serve you alone and to go all the way and to give you my all. And I thank you that I will be your good and faithful servant. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer, please contact us online, even after the live stream. We want to pray for you, give you some free resources. And in the auditorium, you should come to the front after the service. Amen. Did you guys enjoy tonight? Amen. What a powerful, exciting service. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. And again, if you still need prayer, you can come to the front and online we'll cross over for you guys as well. Lord God, we're coming for in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, thank you, God, for this message, Lord, that you spoke through our pastor day tonight. And God, Lord, we choose to go all the way. We choose, Lord God, to go all the way, Lord God. Lord, we are desirous, Lord to not just know the literal meaning or the figurative, Lord, but God, to understand the glory levels, God, to understand the mysteries of Christ Jesus. Lord God, as Lord God, to understand, Holy Spirit, all that you gave. 
And God, we thank you right now that Paul wrote as well that, Holy Spirit, you help bring understanding. You help show us what is our inheritance in Christ. What is the mysteries of the kingdom? And Holy Spirit, right now, we ask, Lord, that you enlighten our spirits right now. Enlighten our spirits, Lord, everyone here in the auditorium. Lord God, watching us online, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the, that spirit of the fear of God which brings wisdom. You are the spirit of wisdom and of understanding. And Lord God, I thank you right now, Lord, that those, Lord, who have heard, those, Lord God, who have received understanding, Lord God, I pray that as your word says, more will be added unto them, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, open, Lord God, dimensions of your supernatural God. Open up, Lord God, the heavenly gates, Lord God, the ancient doors, Lord God. Open up, Lord God, the mysteries of heaven. And I thank you, Lord God, that as we seek you, Lord God, your word says that you will show us great and mighty things that we have never seen before. And God, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And I thank you, God, you've called us to be, Lord God, little gods on the earth. You've called us as sons and daughters of God. You called us, Lord, as kings, Lord, Lord God, and as queens, Lord, to unravel and to unearth your mysteries. And we thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, we will do it, Lord God. And I pray that all of us, Lord, will go all the way, Lord God, with you, Lord, 100%, God, in Jesus' mighty name. And, Lord God, I thank you right now. Cover every single person with your blood, both online and on campus. God, take us safely to wherever we need to go. And I thank you, God, your angels. God, protect us, Lord God, as well. Thank you, Lord, for a powerful Friday intercession, Lord God, and a powerful Sunday service as well. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless. We'll see you soon on Friday night. For intercession, it's not live stream anymore, so you need to be in person. And then Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Amen.